morning. I always, I always hate to be the person that has to interrupt those fantastic conversations that are taking place at the tables. How's everyone this morning? Oh, that was kind of weak. How's everyone doing this morning? Excellent, excellent. So for those of you that I haven't had the opportunity to meet quickly this morning, my name is Paul Blum. I am the interim CEO of the National Parkinson's Foundation. Um, it is my honor and privilege to welcome all of you for our first uh, of hopefully uh, many more to come caregiver summits. Um, I've been involved with the Parkinson's community for about 15 years. Um, I was asked to get involved in Minnesota as a volunteer board member 15 years ago and not having had Parkinson's in my family, um, it required a lot of research to get up to speed. And over the course of the last 15 years, I've been board president of the Minnesota chapter. I've been co-chair of the, the annual walk and the annual gala and a variety of different things. But the thing that always kept me involved with the Parkinson's community and the reason why Parkinson's has become my, my adult um, focus is the resilience not only of people who are living with Parkinson's and their, their determination not to be defined by the disease but to, to define how they live with the disease, but the resilience and the care and the compassion and the love of those people that, that those people with Parkinson's are surrounded by, the caregivers that give so much of themselves to make sure that the person with Parkinson's isn't defined by the disease and isn't allowing the disease to define the course, but defining the course of how that works. And one of the things that we've realized in particular with our Parkinson's Outcome Project is the real effects of caregiving and the long-term effects of caregiving, the importance of caregivers caring for themselves and taking that time. And so that's why when this conversation started uh, about a year ago about having this caregiver summit in conjunction with the World Parkinson Congress, it was so exciting when our friends at Acadia um, stepped up to the plate and said, we agree with you. We think this is really an important thing. So um, is there, there are a couple of folks from Acadia. If you're here, could you stand and let us thank you for uh, helping us with that? And you know, any really good idea that, that gets some funds to support it coming to fruition requires the amazing skill of coordination and volunteer committees. And, and I'm really, really thrilled um, that Vaughn came back into the room and she's not hiding out in the hallway because at the, at the heart of this is Vaughn Edelson. And would everyone who served on the steering committee, the planning committee, would you stand up and let us thank you for your help in putting this day together? So, Vaughn, do I have 25 more minutes? No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> really, this is, this is a really important day, and I'm, and I'm just so excited that there's so many of you here. It is my honor and privilege to introduce the person who's gonna open and close the day with you, Susan Imke. I have an 80-year-old hip and a 68-year-old body. <laughs> Thank you. Am I on, guys? You're on. Okay. And could somebody get my presentation up for me? Aha. Uh -huh. I'm sorry I wasn't paying attention. I really shouldn't be allowed to eat bacon for breakfast. <laughs> you know, I think. Uh, I won't be using that. I might. Yeah. Okay. Let me move that so I'm not looking over you. So thank you again for coming. I think this, this planning committee and the MPF folks have just done a magnificent job. When I looked at the agenda for this meeting, you just can't help but be excited. Um, many of you don't know me. I'm a nurse practitioner from Texas, so uh, this accent is as good as it gets. If you have to work, really work to listen to me, well, that will keep you focused. So, so I won't apologize for that. I love being in Portland. I used to come occasionally with the Health Sciences Center people here. Um, some of you who are in this region, you know Dr. Jay Nutt? 
So there were a few years when Dr. Nutt and I were on the same lecture circuit many times. And typically I was the comic relief for some neurologist, evidently Dr. Nutt on occasion, or uh, some neurosurgeon that took themselves just a little too seriously, and then I was the follow-up act. So one year when they invited me to speak, they had me, Julie Carter had me listed as the keynote. And I was just a little bit puffed up and excited about that. So I did my talk first. And then Dr. Nutt delivered a lovely, very intelligent lecture on non-motor features of Parkinson's disease. And he gestured to me at the end of his talk and he said, Susan, um, we're delighted to have you as our keynote, but the truth is the order of the program is that just for once I wanted to have the last word. <laughs> so, you know, Oregon's a very green place, have you noticed? I don't just mean lots of trees, I mean the, the, their environmental bent is very, very green. I first noticed it, oh dear, we're taped, but I think I'll tell this story anyway. So I first noticed it at the airport yesterday. What do you want to do when you first get off of a four hour flight? Go to the bathroom. So I made my way to the ladies room and I noticed that in Portland they actually give you instructions for flushing. <laughs> so it said, for liquid waste, press the handle down once. And there was one little water drop to show you that it was less water than solid waste, which had three little drops of water, and you push the handle up. So I thought and thought, and I had used two little squares of toilet paper, so solid, right? But not solid. So I decided on two downs for two drops and just to accommodate the situation. So today I'm going to use the acronym of IDEAS, I-D-E-A-S. We're going to talk really briefly about identity, dignity, emotional integrity, and that's going to be one of the big ones. Then the assessment, and you might cheat and look ahead to page 9 in your booklets where the self-assessment tool is. And then we're going to talk about sustenance, because sustenance is what you will be taking from the day and our time together today. As a family caregiver, and I'm going to assume that everyone in the room is either in that role or in a paid caregiving role for someone with Parkinson's disease, I find it very difficult to keep myself in sight. I'm keeping everybody else in my sight line. Are my coworkers doing okay? Is my husband doing okay? Are my patients doing okay? And periodically, it is necessary to be very mindful about checking in with myself to say, Am I doing okay? And then your personal identity beyond your role as a care partner. What does that look like and what do you want it to look like? And then lastly, um, I think all of us have to remember that no matter what those Oil of Olay commercials tell us, 60 is not the new 40. <laughs> so in addition to asking on our life path, what do our people with Parkinson's disease need to change or delegate? or give up trying to do, perhaps, in some cases. We need to ask those questions for ourselves. What is not reasonable simply because of the age and stage we're in in life? Uh, sometimes I think that marriage is a, a problem with mood contamination. Um, here he says, I'm depressed today, and if you really loved me, you'd have the decency to feel depressed too. But I find that we spell each other. Do you ever notice that? Only one person per couple is allowed to be psychotic at the time. You know, you, you, can't, you can't go down that hill as a team. So let's think about dignity together. It, dignity, by Webster's Ben, is the quality of being worth, esteem, or honor. Proper, key word there, proper pride and self-respect. You've heard the adage that you teach people how to treat you. Yeah, we're going to come back to that a little bit this afternoon when I'm uh, wrapping us up. Secondly, is it possible to guard the dignity of another person? How many of you put some time, energy, passion into protecting the dignity of your person with Parkinson's disease? Yeah, I realized just the other evening that we've kind of quit going out to eat so much with other people because eating is a little messier configuration for my husband at the age of 85 than it used to be. 
If we do go out to eat, I'm kind of careful who sits where. And, you know, five years ago, this stuff wouldn't have even been on my radar screen. So one of the things I've learned um, it, with a husband with Parkinson's is uh, because he was thoughtful enough to develop the only illness that I'm really capable of treating. Um, <laughs> but is that uh, caregiving is a lot like uh, organic chemistry. The lecture is interesting and a little bit fun when I'm roaming around the country talking about family caregiving, but the lab, the lab can be a bitch, you know, and it, it, it's really dependent on who your lab partner is, so uh, a lot of things to consider that. And then secondly, about our own dignity. I think all of us need to ask from time to time, how dignified do we really need to be, you know? I mean, you, you don't have to be at your best, at your prettiest, at your smartest every day, all day long. And once you take that in, and I'm looking at folks of a certain age in this room, I think everybody kind of knows that in all likelihood. So honesty with others is the definition of integrity. It's being honest and fair, being complete, being whole, incorruptibility. Interesting to be talking about that in a presidential election year, huh? A sidebar here, all of you who are in healthcare now, so I do a lot of mental status testing. And one of the questions you would typically ask after what day of the week is it today is who's the president in the United States. But I have taken that off of my list until after the elections. Because <laughs> the answers are just too long, you know, so. <clears throat> and then soundness. Sound, solid, in your dealings with other people, and that's integrity. Emotional integrity, whole different kettle of fish, requires taking seriously your duty to know yourself, facing uncomfortable truths so that they don't harm you or the people you love, being willing to speak your truth, and then owning your mistakes and weaknesses. Let me give you a very short example of speaking your truth that I struggled with this week. Um, we had, my husband's brother died, so the only close relative, one son, frankly is quite crazy, and he was planning this event. And it was like um, Baptist get together in 1954. You know, so it was, they were gonna have open viewing for the visitation and then open viewing for the memorial service. And my temptation would have been to say, Frank is not feeling really well, I don't think we'll come over on Thursday evening or to say, other relatives are coming in, I'm not quite sure when they'll get here. And I finally got up the nerve to say, Daryl, you and I have never talked about this, but I need to remember that person who was so special to me, the way he's always been in my mind. I do not want to replace it with the vision of someone already passed. Um, and he was quiet for a little while on the phone, but I felt good later that I was able to speak that, and it's not my usual. I normally would have made something up with absolutely no guilty conscience at all. So learning to speak your truth in love, not this thing that some of the young kids call brutal honesty, that's an oxymoron, you know, so, uh, but learning to speak your truth is a very important part of this, particularly to your Parkinson partner, and then owning your own mistakes. Communication is a huge deal, is it not, in uh, long-term relationships? So can you see the slide from back in the back? She's saying, mew. He says, moo, whatever. So it's tough. Making it personal. This is, um, my husband got a zebra blanket not too long ago, and my daughter thought this was a real cute shot of us. So these are the things that those of us in the caregiving chairs ask all the time. What can I do or not do? I'm talking about your own caregiving responsibility. I make some home visits now in our practice. I'm in a private practice in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And uh, I, I often say to people, the job is bigger than the worker. I told a wife last week, if I had owned a nursing home and she needed a job, I would hire her but not for three shifts a day, seven days a week. You know, the people's real, sometimes we need a ruthless assessment of what we can and cannot do. When should I help or hold back? How many times, how often do you ask that? I mean, it's a constant tension, not necessarily in a negative tension way, but it's a constant awareness of when to jump in 
and when to let them struggle with dressing or decision making or whatever it is on their own. And then when should I share and not share? I think that's the toughest, particularly in a marriage or couple situation where you've always been partners in every decision, in every, in every activity for the most part, and now sometimes there's greater wisdom in need to know basis for communication, and I find that exquisitely painful. So we need to take care of ourselves, and that's what today's about. Sustenance, I would in, encourage you to start embracing new challenges. Make an effort today to live in the moment. What does that mean? You know, it sounds like something right out of a you know, Methodist growth group, but what does that mean to live in the moment? What it means today for us together is to turn off your cell phones. Now, if you've got somebody next door, you can be exempted. Uh, but generally speaking, vibrate's not good enough because it's still there and you still know it and you will check it because we're habituated to those things. But just one hour at a time today, vow to yourself and if you will, kind of as if we're a covenant group, to plug into just what's happening here and give that a try just this one Monday. Stay tuned and be aware of things that happen during the day um, that might create sustainable change. And that will be my theme for the afternoon. And then today, we're going to be each other's support group, not this one necessarily. So that, that is our mission for today. And I would suggest to you that if you can do those things, by four o'clock this afternoon, you will be changed. In what way, I don't know. But you will be changed if you can gather the most out of our gathering. Thank you very much, and I'll see you this afternoon.